while the story of those Northern Powers battalions raised in 1914 will be forever associated with the Battle of the Somme, their war continued beyond Picardy, and in May 1917, what was left of the Powers found themselves in front of a dark wood, Oppy Wood, near Arras. We've returned to the battlefields around the northern French city of Arras this week. Arras is perhaps one of the less visited battlefields of the Great War, but it was an important part of the British sector of the Western Front. We took over the area around Arras from the French in 1916, and for the next two years, the final two years of the war, just about every regiment of the British Army passed through here, and many of the men who served on the front during that period served at Arras, so for them it was as important as the Somme or Ypres. It was a a battlefield that in 1916, when we first took over the area, was a quiet part of the front, but in 1917, with the Battle of Arras, one of the deadliest battles that the British Army fought on the Western Front took place here in April and May of 1917, and we're going to look at one aspect of that during this week's walk. But as with all these battlefields that we visit, We can't see it in isolation because the fighting returned to Arras in 1918 with the German offensive in March of 1918 when they broke through in the area that we're about to walk but were stopped on the outskirts of Arras. And then in the summer with the final offensive the Germans were pushed back. The Hindenburg line was broken leading to the final phase of the war leading up to the end of the conflict with Mons on the 11th of November 1918. But all of that was way into the future in terms of the ground that we're starting on today. We're walking up a a little grass path alongside a railway embankment. To our right, the trains run from Arras up through to Lens and beyond that to Lille. This is one of the main routes across this part of northern France. And again, we've often spoken about trains in the Great War. and, And this line obviously existed at the time of the First World War. The Germans used it a little bit further up to bring troops, equipment, materiel down from northern France at their railhead near Lille down into the sectors around the the Lons and Douai plain to reinforce their troops here. And, And it's worth remembering that the Germans used the implementation of railway systems like this in exactly the same way that the Allies did. Railways were very much part of the war. And I've mentioned this phrase in several podcasts now that the historian AJP Taylor coined that phrase war by timetable talking about the opening phase of the war with the the Schlieffen plan and the Germans were masters of the implementation of trains to move their troops to the front and that would set a pattern really for the important role that the railways had for much of the rest of the war. From a modern perspective in visiting the battlefields today And again, this is something that I always recommend. It's quite good to take these railway journeys across the battlefield. And the train that runs from Arras up across this ground, so crosses some of the 1917 and 18 battlefields, and you can see the high ground of the Pont du Jour, where the 9th Scottish Division Memorial is, and some of the isolated battlefield cemeteries. And in the distance, the magnificent memorial of Vimy Ridge up on Hill 145, it takes you across this ground and behind the German lines and you get a sense of the sort of ground that existed there that the Germans used as their battlefield infrastructure to billet their troops to bring their guns and ammunition and equipment up and these are also the locations that they used to treat their wounded and to marshal allied prisoners of war often marched through these places up to Lille to be taken back to prisoner of war camps in Germany. So this railway that runs alongside us now as we walk across this grass path towards the cemetery ahead of us is all part of this crisscross pattern of railways that cut across the battlefields of the Great War here on the Western Front. Having walked the path, we've arrived at the main gate of this cemetery, and it's a small battlefield cemetery, Albura Cemetery. Albura is the name of a battle in the Peninsular War when Wellington fought the French in Spain and it's a battle most closely associated with the 57th Regiment of Foot which later became the Middlesex Regiment and in that battle their colonel fell mortally wounded and cried out to his men, Die hard lads, die hard! And the Middlesex Regiment, when it became the Middlesex in the 1880s, 
took that nickname of the diehards, referring back to that battle at Abura in 1811. The cemetery is a, a frontline burial site, not made during the capture of this ground in April of 1917, but used thereafter once the village the close by of Balliol was captured and the front lines moved beyond that towards where we're going to walk to, which is the ground around Oppie and Oppie Wood. There are 254 burials in this cemetery, 253 of them British and one German, and there are two distinct plots that were once referred to as the North and the South plots of the cemetery. Because it is a frontline burial cemetery, the men who are buried here are largely identified graves. They are men killed in the frontline area or in the approach to the battlefield and then brought back here for burial by their own comrades. So it was known who they were. It's not a post-war concentration cemetery or a cemetery that was used to move in isolated graves in any number from the surrounding battlefields. And it was a, a cemetery that remained in use beyond the Battle of Arras here in April and May of 1917, right up into the 1918 period when the Germans swept through here and captured this ground during their march offensive, stopped just to the north around Vimy Ridge and then to the south on the outskirts of Arras itself. What ties together the grounds that will walk from here at the cemetery across to the village of Oppie and Oppie Wood is the involvement of POWs battalions, Northern POWs battalions. Now the POWs are a, a unit, an organisation that we tend to think of most closely associated with the Battle of the Somme in 1916. And indeed, the men of the 31st Division, this Northern POWs division with the Accrington POWs, the Barnsley POWs, the Bradford POWs, the Hull POWs, the Leeds POWs, the Sheffield City Battalion. These were men who had fought on the Somme both on the first day at Serre and then in the closing aspect of the battle in November of 1916. But their war didn't just end there. They'd suffered tremendous casualties in, in both of those engagements. But their war, like all of these regiments of the British Army, was a long one. And although many of the original powers had fallen on the Somme, and the character of these battalions began to change. So in the Barnsley Powers, which is my local battalion, where I live here in South Yorkshire, the character of the battalion began to take men from a much wider area than just Barnsley. It still had that identity as a Barnsley battalion, because Barnsley men had been wounded on the Somme at Serre, recovered from their wounds and came back so there was still this influx and when we look at some of the later recruits that replace those losses on the Somme we do still see a continuing Barnsley connection so when I look at some of the men on local war memorials around me here I see men who were not original powers who didn't join the Barnsley powers right at the beginning of the war but waited to either join the Derby scheme which was the last period of voluntary enlistments in 1915 on into early 1916 or were conscripted and when they were either derby men or conscripts they went to the York and Lanks depot did their training and then were very often posted to the Barnsley battalion when they got to the western front so that continuation of of men coming from the same region did seem to continue in at least some of these powers battalions but then you look at some of the losses as the war went on whether it's in the Hull Powers or the Leeds Powers or the Sheffield City Battalion, and you see men from all over Britain being killed in those ranks. And when you look at them, they come from a multitude of different regiments. So there was some influx of men from other parts of Britain. But the identity of these battalions and their reference to them being the first Barnsley Powers, the second Barnsley Powers or the Sheffield City Battalion is something that you see continued to be used right up to the very end of their war. And here in Albura Cemetery, we see plots of these Powers battalions, including quite a lot of men from the Barnsley Powers. And I've brought quite a few people from Barnsley to this cemetery over the years on our Ledger Battlefield Tours. It's quite a tricky one to reach with a coach, as we'll see when we begin the walk shortly. But it's always good to come to a place like this because this is on the fringe of the popular areas of, of the Great War battlefields and, and cemeteries like this I suspect don't get a large number of visitors and it's always a pleasure and, and an honour really to bring family members to visit a grave in a place like this as well because in many cases particularly with those who lived in the north of England where travel across to the battlefields was to say the least quite challenging then it's always good to think that perhaps they are the first to come to visit this grave. 
and when we wander amongst the plots of these Powell's Battalion men buried here, whether they're from the Barnsley Powell's or the other battalions, what we're seeing is men not killed in the great battles of the First World War, not with bayonets fixed charging the enemy. We're seeing men killed in the day-to-day -day attritional warfare when this area around Balliol and Oppie became a, a static part of the front and these are men killed in the day-to-day -day activities of trench warfare. After the fighting here in April and May of 1917, the Powell's Battalion of the 31st Division stayed in this sector right up until the early part of 1918 when they moved to the southern side of Arras to take part in the fighting against the German offensive in the ground between Arras and the Somme. So this became one of the sectors on the Western Front where they spent the longest part of their war and where for many of those Powell's who served here, this was the defining moment of their war. Not in the big battles like Serre or later on in the fighting against the Kaiserschlags, but in this long slog, trench warfare, static warfare, in muddy ditches facing the enemy, often in atrocious weather. The winter of 1917-18 that they spent here was not a good one. Not as cold as the Somme the previous year, but not a good one. And many, many soldiers collapsed and became ill and were sent home as a consequence of that. Now when you walk amongst the graves in these cemeteries you always find yourself looking at the personal inscriptions and when I first came to Alberta Cemetery in the late 1980s there was one right by the main entrance that immediately struck me because it referenced the name of the cemetery. Now to see the cemetery name referenced in the personal inscription is quite unusual. In fact, I can't think of another example, and possibly some of you listening to this may well have come across one, and if you have so, tweet me or send me a message via the website or via email. And the grave that we're talking about is that of Charles Edward McKenna. He was a 19-year-old who served with the 1st 4th Battalion of the London Regiment. He was from Glasgow, originally enlisted in the Army Service Corps, and what happened later on in the war is they took A1 physically fit men like Charles out of the Army Service Corps in a rear echelon job because they needed young fit men like him in the infantry. So men who were in the Army Service Corps and some of these other behind-the-lines type units suddenly found themselves combed out of what were fairly safe jobs away from much of the fighting, suddenly being thrust into the infantry and being right there on the battlefield. And he was posted to the 1st 4th Londons, which was part of the 56th London Division, and he was killed in the defence of this ground when that division held the line between here and Vimy Ridge in March 1918. He was killed on the 28th of March as the Germans broke through and captured this ground here around the village of Balliol. But the inscription on his grave reads, he does not lie in Albura, he is in heaven. So that's the reason behind the reference to the cemetery. It's a religious reference to the fact that although this might be his grave, he now rests in the great beyond in heaven. So as another train thunders by and the echoes of the modern world drift across this cemetery from more than a century ago, we walk back down the grass path and get onto the track that leads up to this area. Part of it is still cobbled, the cobbles are still visible there. It's the old Pave Road that we often read about in accounts of the First World War. The soldiers marched along these roads, all of the roads once looked like this, and this little minor road that comes from out of the village to where the cemetery is still has a portion of it. And we walk under a big arched railway bridge here with the railway passing over us, and you'll see just how difficult it is to get a coach up here. We're lucky to have some excellent and very patient ledger drivers. Quite a few of them are ex-services, and, and they love doing the battlefield tours. And when we make personal pilgrimages like this on behalf of family members who are on the tours, they're very keen to help and get engaged and, and make it possible. But it just shows how isolated some of these cemeteries are. And when you look across the Western Front, with over 2,000 British and Commonwealth cemeteries from the Great War, you can see how even in this modern world it is challenging sometimes to get to certain locations. Some of them remain well off the beaten track. And perhaps that's part of their charm, if that's the right word, to be able to come to places like this, to escape, be surrounded by the birdsong and the skylarks above, and rest for a while in the company of those silent headstones in the cemeteries of the Great War. But we'll continue along this little track, it'll eventually meet the road, and we'll turn left, and that'll take us into the village, and that'll be our next stop. <laughs> 
The village of Balliol Sir Bertrand, where we are now, was behind the German lines at the beginning of the Battle of Arras in April 1917. It was ground defended by Bavarian troops at that time, and this village, like any village behind the British sector of the Western Front, was used by the Germans as part of their battlefield infrastructure. Probably at the beginning of the war, when German troops met the French around Arras in 1914 and the front stabilised, French civilians continued to live in this village, but gradually as the war moved on, the Germans evacuated civilians from these areas close to their trenches, fearful of any information they might be able to pass through to agents who were operating behind the German front in the same way that German agents were almost certainly operating behind the British and French fronts, but also because they were then responsible for these French civilians when poison gas came along and heavy artillery began to bombard villages like this, and they didn't want that responsibility. So the French were displaced and they moved off to places in the occupied zone, the German-occupied zone of France, many of them in this area, up to places like Lille, um, and some across the border into Belgium. By 1917, it was very much part of the German military zone in this area, so the village would have been used to billet troops going in and out of the line, not so much in the houses because gradually they had been demolished by shell fire, but in the cellars beneath. The Germans, as many participants in the war did, went underground in that great troglodyte war that the Great War turned into, and this network of cellars beneath the village was utilised by the Germans to house their troops moving up and coming back from the trenches. There were also supply depots here, ammunition stores. The Germans had their field artillery located here. When you look at the ground around Balliol, there's quite a few perfect locations, little dips where guns could be established and fire in protection of the German frontline positions, which for the units that served at Balliol when it was an area behind their front line, the actual front line was near to the village of Rocklincourt, facing first the French and then the British from 1916 onwards. Just to the north of Balliol is Vimy Ridge, and on the 9th of April 1917, the Canadian Corps attacked there and took that ground, and the ground around the village was on the join between two British formations, the 51st Highland Division and the 34th Division to the south, and those units got to the outskirts of the village of Balliol on the 9th of April, with the front line just west of the village, occupied by units of the Highland Division. The Germans held on to the village until around about the 12th to the 14th of April. To the north, the whole of Vimy Ridge by the 14th of April was in Canadian hands, and the Germans pivoted slightly on their line and gave way a bit of that ground, because positions like this were then out in a salient, in a curve in the line, and were vulnerable. So rather than lose men in trying to defend this to the last brick, they pulled back, and they pulled back to stronger German defences in the next line of defence around the ground between the villages of Arleur and Oppy. And with the capture of Balliol and the positions, the British positions now moving to the eastern side of the village, facing Oppy and Oppy Wood and Arleur to the north, Balliol became part of our battlefield infrastructure. So those same valleys that had once sheltered German guns no doubt sheltered British guns. And of course, this caused a problem because the Germans weren't stupid. They knew if they'd once sheltered their guns in valleys like that, once that ground was taken, it's quite likely the Allies would do exactly the same thing. So those positions were targeted by German artillery. And when we think of the gunners being behind the trenches, the infantry often called them thousand-mile snipers, the gunners were not safe in any shape or form. And when we look at battlefield cemeteries, we often find the graves of men from the Royal Field Artillery or the Royal Garrison Artillery killed in gun positions like this in ground that had been taken during advances and became contested ground as both sides tried to silence each other's artillery and gunners paid the price. With the capture of Balliol, the units involved in the fighting in the early stage of the battle were withdrawn and that's when the POWs battalions of the 31st Division moved into this sector. There was a temporary halt in operations here. When they took over, it became a static part of the Arras front, with the fighting continuing to the south, facing the main German Hindenburg line, so in the ground directly east of Arras to the southeast area, so in villages like monchy le preux Wancourt, Quasi and Boulcourt. But gradually, as the battle progressed in those areas, there was a necessity to 
to tie up the loose ends in this northern part of the battlefield and an attack was planned on a big scale for the 3rd of May 1917 with the Canadians in the north towards positions called the Arle Loop then down to the area around Oppie and Gavrel where the Powers battalions were located and then in village after village along the Arras front where British and Australian troops were at the far end of the battlefield. The Australians would attack at Bullecourt, for example. So this was a big assault and one of the deadliest days in the Battle of Arras in 1917. So we're going to walk now out of the village, take the road towards Gavrel, the D49, until it reaches a, a fork just on the outskirts of Balliol, where the Rue de Opie goes off to the left. And we'll follow that out into the vast open field between Balliol and Opie village, to a point where we get to a pumping station on the left-hand side, where we get a good view across this part of the battlefield. And that'll be our next stop. Where we're standing now gives us a, a good view across this part of the battlefield. The village of Balliol is behind us, and ahead of us we can see the spire of Oppie and the trees of Oppie Wood. We can also see how open this ground is, absolutely devoid of cover from the edge of Balliol up to where the trees of the wood near to the village of Oppie are located. There's absolutely nothing and it's pretty flat. There's a few bits of dead ground, but otherwise that's it. And anyone attacking across this ground between Balliol and Oppie would be completely exposed and an attack in broad daylight would be suicidal. So for the assault here on the 3rd of May, it would take place in the early hours of the morning when there was enough darkness to shield the advance of the troops. At least that was the plan. But the men who led the assault in the ground where we are now and who are most closely associated with the story of the battle here at Oppie Wood are the men of the 10th, 11th, 12th and 13th battalions of the East Yorkshire Regiment, the Hull Pals. Officially just the 1st, 2nd, 3rd and 4th Hull Battalions but they were known as the Hull Commercials, the Hull Tradesmen's, the Hull Sportsmen's Battalion, and then the final one, the 13th, they were a battalion recruited from all over Hull, not from one specific part of the community, and known as Tothers. Hull was a city of narrow terrace streets based around a shipping industry and a fishing fleet, and it had a very, very strong territorial battalion at the opening phase of the war, so there was a need for a Powers Battalion within the city and the response was quite incredible. Although many men were serving in the Navy or serving in the Merchant Navy, there were ordinary folk of Hull who wanted to do their bit and to raise four battalions from a relatively small city like Hull was really quite some achievement. They'd gone out to defend the Suez Canal in 1915 with the other Powers Battalions in their division and then had come to the Somme in the spring of 1916, in those months leading up to the battle. On the first day, they'd not been directly involved in the attack on Serre, they'd been in reserve. But their turn would come at the end of the battle, on exactly the same ground where the other Powers battalions had been annihilated on the 1st of July, when they attacked the village of Serre in very different conditions. The 1st of July had been that perfect summer's day. The 13th of November 1916 was mud thick glutinous mud in no man's land and heavy rain terrible conditions and sadly the same fate befell them as the other powers battalions had experienced on that first day of the Somme and in that cold winter of 1916-17 when they'd held the line on the northern part of the Somme around the village of Hebuturn they'd gradually rebuilt those four Hull battalions to a point where they were ready for battle again here at Oppie in May of 1917. But none of the battalions that attacked here were anywhere near full strength. About 1,100 officers and men is the paper strength of an infantry battalion. Most of the units that were here were probably mustering something in the six to 700 officers and men. So when we look at the casualties they suffered, we see that proportionally these were high losses in the context of the number of men that were serving on the ground at the time. The night of the 2nd, 3rd May 1917 was a moonlit night, a clear night with a strong, bright moon. And the moon was behind the village of Balliol, so behind the attacking troops. And when they assembled in this open ground to make their assault in the early hours of the 3rd of May, they were illuminated by the moonlight. This caused great problems. They could be seen by the Germans. And there was a problem here as well. 
with the use of their artillery to support them. We learned from the battles of the Great War that any attack, any unit on the ground is only as good as the artillery that can support it. And here at Balliol, on this side of the village, facing Oppie, the ground was too open to have field gun positions. They were occupying, as we've said previously, some of those old German positions on the other side of the village. And while, of course, there were forward observers here, the guns were firing, in many cases, at their extreme range. And this caused a few problems in actually targeting the key German defences that needed to be knocked out to allow the men of these powers battalions to make their advance. From where we're standing, we're very close to where the British front line was at this particular point. It was an outpost line occupying bits of old trench and newly dug positions. The Germans were just this side of Oppie Wood facing where we were. So the front line wasn't the wood itself. It was just in front of the wood running across to Arla to the left and down towards Gavrel to the right. So on that moonlit morning, the men of the 11th, 12th and 13th battalions of the East Yorkshire Regiment despite those losses on the Somme still full amongst the ranks of the battalions of men from the city of Hull, assembled in this bright moonlit, caught by the Germans, and a bombardment dropped straight on their assembly positions as they were forming up to make their attack, causing not just casualties but a lot of confusion. The assault began, and crossing that open ground not properly protected by the artillery, the ground was raked by fire, and casualties began to mount. Only small parties got into the German positions, and even smaller ones made their way to the wood itself. Most of those men were never seen again, either killed or wounded and taken prisoner. The assault on the woods had failed, and to the south men of the Bradford powers had attacked between the village of Oppie and Gavrel, and their assault too had been repulsed, although they'd got into some of the German positions. It was stalemate, and along the entire front on the 3rd of May 1917, there was very little gain, just incredible, terrible casualties. It wasn't the end of the Battle of Arras, it would go on for another ten or so days, but it felt like its death throes, given the terrible scale of the casualties suffered on that morning of the 3rd of May 1917. For the men of these PALS battalions here between Oppie and Gavrel, there were nearly 2,000 casualties, of which at least half were men from the Hull battalions. Oppie Wood had proved a costly battlefield for these men of the East Yorkshire Regiment. We'll continue now along the Rue de Oppie and follow it to where it gets to the edge of the wood, and that'll be our next stop. We've reached the edge of Oppie Wood now, and the road that we've just walked often is lined with the detritus of war. All the times I've come down here, there have been shells liberally sprinkled where the farmers have placed them alongside the road, waiting for the Arras bomb squad to come along and remove them and take them away for disposal. We tend to think of that iron harvest being just associated with Ypres or the Somme, but across hundreds of miles of northern and eastern France, French farmers are finding this stuff and French bomb disposal units are going round to pick it up to safely dispose of it. This legacy of the Great War rolls on and on, and will probably roll on for many centuries to come. The sheer scale of the artillery deployed by both sides in the Great War, and the huge number of shells that still remain on these battlefields, is something that you only really truly realise as you visit places again and again, and it's not that you're seeing the same old shells each year, it's that you're seeing shell after shell after shell being recovered by farmers, being recovered in agricultural work or building work, and then having to be disposed of. Battlefields of the Great War were described at the time as shell-pocked landscapes, and now, over a century later, they're shell-saturated landscapes, where the detritus, the munitions of the conflict, from grenades through to one-ton high-explosive shells are still recovered in such great numbers every year. Standing on this corner of Oppie Woods, we can turn around and look back towards Balliol and again see it from a, from a German perspective, but see how open this ground is. Really, any attack here, unless properly supported, and the Germans defending this position, suppressed in their trenches and within the wood itself, really stood no chance at all. 
and we can see how this became terrible killing ground on the 3rd of May 1917. When we look into Oppie Wood itself, there's very little to see from the Great War. It's a wood that regrew after the conflict, like many of these woods across the battlefields of the First World War. And while amongst the trees we can see the undulation of shell holes and that this was once shell-smashed grounds and the wood was just a matchstick wood, the wood recovered and hid the traces of the old war. So there are no trenches here and the wood is private property so you can't just wander around it and look. But on the edge of it there's a new memorial. I'm not really sure to place this here but it commemorates the Hull Powells and it remembers Jack Harrison VC, who was a member of the 11th Battalion, the East Yorkshire Regiment, awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for his bravery here in the attack on the 3rd of May 1917. Jack Harrison was a 27-year-old former teacher and a rugby professional. He was a professional rugby player. He'd played for Hull FC before the war. Jack was a Hull boy made good. His father was a boiler maker for ships, He'd done well at school and went to study in York to train to be a teacher and he returned to Hull in 1912 and married a local girl. He'd begun to play rugby while he was in York and then he joined Hull FC and in some of the matches that he took part in just before the war the crowds were quite substantial. One match in 1914 over 19,000 people saw him play so he was a, a very well-known local man at the time of the Great War. He joined the Hull Powers as a private and then he was commissioned in 1915 and went across with them to Suez and then served on the Somme. After the war, the 11th Battalion in which he served published their own battalion history and there's a few photographs in there including a really great one of him in a dugout at Hebuturn in 1916 wearing a, a sheepskin or a goatskin jerkin and I'll put a, a copy of that on the podcast website oldfrontline.co.uk so you can have a look at it along with some other photographs of the Hull Pals. Jack Harrison had already been awarded the Military Cross before this action here at Oppie. In February 1917 he'd led a patrol in no man's land. At that time of the, the fluid movement of the lines on the Somme as the Germans pulled back to the Hindenburg line there was a lot of this patrol work where they went out to try and find where the Germans were, for example. And in one of those patrols, he led his men forward and was awarded the Military Cross for his gallantry on that occasion. In the fighting here on the 3rd of May 1917, for which he was awarded the Victoria Cross, the citation talks about a dark wood. And I think that sums up what Oppie Wood was all about, both physically in terms of what it was like on the battlefield at that time, and I think a slightly more onerous aspect when you consider the casualties that took place here. He led his company, he was a company commander by this stage, towards the enemy positions under very heavy rifle and machine gun fire and their attack was stopped. So he reorganised the survivors in the darkness. Perhaps the moonlight worked to his advantage at that particular point so he could muster his men together and they attacked again. And at this point a particular German machine gun was inflicting heavy losses on his company, so he single-handedly rushed at the gun to silence it. The fight continued into the wood, and it is believed that Jack Harrison got into Oppie Wood itself, but he was never seen alive again. His body was never recovered after the war, and he's listed on the Arras Memorial to the Missing. Awarded a posthumous Victoria Cross for his bravery that day, his widow went to collect it from the King at Buckingham Palace, in March 1918. Jack and his wife Lillian had a son John who would grow up in the shadow of the loss of his father and the Great War but would become an officer in the Duke of Wellington's regiment by the outbreak of the Second World War sadly to be killed in the defence of Dunkirk in May 1940 echoing the all too common cruel blow that many families had through losses in both world wars. Aside from this memorial here Jack Harrison's name can be found on the Roll of Honour in Hull Station and also a memorial to him in the grounds of the rugby stadium at Hull and there in his home city his name lives on. We'll continue along the Rue de Oppie where it gets to a T-junction at the end we'll turn right to go into Oppie Village and close to the church is the Village War Memorial and a large memorial commemorating the men from Hull and that will be our next stop.
The village war memorial in Oppi shows a French poilu, a French soldier, standing in a trench, grenade in hand, in quite a martial pose, fighting the foe, and a German Stahlhelm still helmet at his feet. It commemorates the men from the village who died in the Great War, and is not untypical of the sorts of memorials that we see as we travel across this part of France. The losses, as we've said many, many times on this podcast, of France in the Great War were truly horrific. 1.4 million dead for a population that was smaller than Britain at the time. Britain alone lost 750,000 in the Great War, so it was almost twice as many. And places like Oppy, villages like this, right across France, not just here on the battlefields, but right across the country, were truly affected on a scale that we could only but imagine. And we see that when we look at the long list of names on memorials like this one. But it's not the French memorial that we've come to have a look at. We're going to turn around and see the memorial on the other side of the road, up against the edge of the wood. And this is the memorial to the men from Kingston-upon-Hull. The city of Hull, having lost so many men on so many different battlefields, and indeed so many men at sea, given the nature of the importance of the shipping and fishing industries within the city, they decided that there would be a memorial placed on the battlefields, the key battlefields, where the men from the city had fought and died, not just commemorating the POWs, but commemorating all of those who'd fallen in the war, but where to place it. There was a a belief after the war, and, and something that continues to this day, that Hull's greatest losses were sustained at Oppie. When we look at the casualty figures, we see actually on the 13th of November 1916, in the Hull Powers attack at Serre, there were slightly more fatal casualties there than there were on the 3rd of May 1917 here at Oppie. But I suspect the connection with Jack Harrison, the award of his Victoria Cross, and the nature of the fighting here on that moonlit morning somehow captured the imagination of the people of Hull. And an obsession with Oppie began and continues to this day. The memorial was raised by public subscription and placed here in 1927. It was on ground donated by a local family whose son, Pierre, had been killed as a tank officer at Guillancourt on the Somme on the 8th of August 1918. It was a nice gesture by a French family in recognition of their own loss to help build a memorial to an entire city's loss, family after family like them having lost a son in the war. It's a multi-denominational memorial. There is a figure of Christ but also a star of David. Later, the dates for the Second World War were added as well. But it is a memorial that doesn't contain any sort of martial figure or any particular reference to specific brave deeds or regiments. It's about commemorating that sense of loss. And and in Hull, there was a great sense of this because we mentioned earlier how it was a city of terraced houses. And in those narrow streets of the city of Hull, almost every one of them had had their own war memorial by 1918 every single street with a list in varying forms of the men who'd gone to war and then highlighting those who died. So that loss was perhaps more visible, more potent in Hull than in some other places as a consequence of these street war memorials. Hull was a city that was blitzed in the Second World War. It suffered terrible damage under Nazi bombs and many of those World War I memorials that were placed in the streets were lost A few still remain, and others are held in the museum at Hull. So it's well worth going there to have a look at this. And the Cenotaph at Hull, which is just outside the railway station, has a connection here to Oppie as well, because a Cenotaph is an empty tomb. But the Cenotaph at Hull isn't quite empty, because in the midst of it, right in the centre of it, is a casket of earth from here at Oppie Wood that sacrificial grounds that Hull held so dear, a tiny piece of it contained in that memorial, commemorating the men from those narrow streets who marched off to fight and die here in 1917. While it's not on the main tourist routes of the battlefields of the Great War, I've stopped here many times myself on Ledger Battlefield tours over the years, and I noticed that during the centenary, people from Hull came here to commemorate the men not just who fell at Oppie but in the wider aspect of the Western Front and on the centenary of the fighting and the death of Jack Harrison and his comrades a party from Hull came to commemorate that but mostly the commemoration is done by the people within Oppie itself 
We forget sometimes how these small villages with these memorials quite literally on their doorstep come out and participate and commemorate on the days when we're not there. And in this past year or so, when we've not been able to travel to the battlefields ourselves because of everything that's happened, it is those people on the ground in France and Belgium who have gone out to continue to pay their respects. And that's a nice thought to have, I think, because it continues with the spirit of remembrance that that French family who gave the ground on which this memorial sits, it's a continuation of that. While sat in a bar at Arras on one trip to the battlefields, I got chatting to some locals, and they spoke about what they felt of the cemeteries and memorials that existed around their city. One of them said to me, they are magnificent places of remembrance, and we go to them because for us, these are the men who save Europe. And those are strong words, but it's nice to think that this subject and this sacrifice and this terrible mourning that cities like Hull had is something that continues to bind us together. Different people from different cultures and different lands brought together in a positive way, and that can only be a good thing. And was it part of the intention of memorials like this? We'll leave Oppie now on the D50 and going south out of the village we'll follow the signs for Gavrel, the next village. And about halfway between the two there is a vast electrical substation on the right hand side. A bit of a blot on the landscape but I guess a necessary one and that'll be our next stop. Where we're standing between the village of Oppie, which we can see across to our left, and we can see a slightly different view of Oppie Woods from where we're standing, and behind us to our right is the village of Gavrel. This was the end point of the Powell's experience at Arras. Oppie was never captured. The attack on the 3rd of May 1917 had failed with those heavy losses, and the woods and the village remained in German hands, until 1918, but a line was established on that western side of Oppie Wood, facing the wood, across to where we are now, and incorporating the village of Gavrel, which had been taken by men of the Royal Naval Division during the fighting at Arras. This became the static front line where those Northern Powers battalions spent the next nine months. The men from Accrington and Barnsley and Bradford and Hull Leeds and Sheffield did their turn in the line here and gradually what remained of those local battalions, what character of local men gradually diminished with it. They kept those titles right to the end of the war as we said at the beginning of this walk but the battalions changed. This was hard warfare for them. These were hard men who'd grown up in tough towns and cities whether that was the mines of Barnsley the steel industries of Sheffield, or the shipping of Hull. But even for them, living in ditches in open fields of northern France, particularly during poor weather, was a difficult experience to endure, and many men broke down with trench fever, with exhaustion through frontline service, and the debilitating nature of the type of warfare that took place here. It just took its toll on these units. There were some local operations, bits of ground were taken, a trench snatched from the enemy, raiding at night, patrolling no man's lands, and all the other aspects of the day-to-day -day static warfare that the Western Front became during those four years of the Great War. And the losses grew with it, aside from those men who broke down under the conditions of trench warfare, Men were killed and wounded every single day these battalions were in the line, with very little after the end of those nine months or more to show for it. Back in the 1990s, I interviewed a couple of men who'd served with the Hull Pals in the Great War. One had been captured at Serre in November 1916, the other one had gone on to serve here at Oppie, and he said that we felt that the army had somehow forgotten about us here, that we'd been relegated to this forgotten part of the Arras front, doing our bits day in, day out. At some point, we would be needed, we would be wanted. And that point came in the spring of 1918, when the battalions were out of the line on rest, 
a much-deserved rest after those many months of serving in the forward positions here, and the Germans had broken through. Other units, men from the London Division, were now holding this ground around Oppi and Gavrel, and they would fight the onslaught of the German advance. But to the south, beyond Arras, towards the Somme, the positions were collapsing and fresh units were needed, and the Powers found themselves on the road once more, marching south to the familiar-sounding names of villages in Picardy, where two years before their war in France and Flanders had begun. For them, another battlefield, a new page in their history, a tale for another day along the old front line. You've been listening to an episode of The Old Front Line with me, military historian Paul Reed. You can follow me on Twitter at Somcor. You can follow the podcast at Old Front Line Pod. Check out the website at oldfrontline.co.uk where you'll find lots of podcast extras and photographs and links to books that are mentioned in the podcast. And if you feel like supporting us, you can go to our Patreon page, patreon.com slash oldfrontline, or support us on Buy Me A Coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash oldfrontline. Links to all of these are on our websites. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you again soon. <laughs>